Well, as you may have noticed, we're doing two weeks on last week's uh, lesson. And I, I, I remember when I, we were putting this together, there were 51 questions that Jesus had asked in John's Gospel, and that was our text for the year. I said, boy, we're going to be one short. So God said, we'll do this one twice. So now, <laughs> now we'll have 52 uh, lessons of questions. Uh, follow with me. Let, let's read our text again. And then we'll do a little review of last week's uh, questions and finish up this week. Uh, John chapter 5, verses 39 through 47. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, Jesus speaking. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. I do not accept glory from human beings, but I know you, and I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. And this was two weeks ago. Question, how can you believe since you accept glory from one another? But do not seek the glory that comes from the only God. But do not think that I accuse you before my Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? Let me, let me just... This thought came this morning. There had not been a, a recognized prophet in Israel for 400 years until John. I think, I, at least I'm going to speak for Tony. I've kind of just, yeah, John, great. John was good. John died. John is Jesus' cousin. Oh, he was most likely the most famous man in Israel at that time. I mean, the people revered John. Uh, when Jesus asked the disciples, whom do you think, say that I am? So, some say you're John the Baptist, raised from the dead. Others say one of the prophets. Even Herod thought that Jesus was a resurrected John. Uh, and, and Jesus says of John, of those born of women, there's no one greater than John. Uh, and then... Here, he's speaking to the Pharisees, and we, uh, maybe rightfully so, we use the word Pharisee as hypocrite. If somebody calls you a Pharisee, it's not a compliment. But Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So the Pharisees weren't ungodly men. They were, I, they were misguided. And in this chapter, this fifth chapter of John, when you think to whom Jesus was speaking, and he was speaking to the people who believed Moses, and rightfully so, they believed the Torah, um, they, they believed the tradition of the Jews, that the Messiah was coming, they believed all that, and Jesus in this one chapter, in these few verses, is emphatically saying who he is. I mean, there was no doubt, there couldn't have been any doubt with those Jews. And the way he did it, he says, if, if you believe Moses, you believe me. I mean, look what I've done. Listen to my words. Uh, and if you don't believe him, how can you believe me? And then think of this. And this, is a, this is a compliment to the Pharisees. Verse 39. You study the scriptures diligently. And that word, it's like, it's almost like a hunting term. You hunt the game until you capture it. I mean, it's, it's emphatic. You study the scriptures like nobody else studies the scriptures. Because you think in the scriptures you have eternal life. But these very scriptures testify of me. I was at a, a, a breakfast yesterday. A young man gave his testimony. It was just, it was really good. It was really powerful. And 
no aspersions to what he said. <coughs> but he never mentioned Jesus. Mm -hmm. He mentioned his obedience to the word. He, he talked about how God has changed his life and by keeping the commandments and by doing these good things. And I, I see that in my own life. I see that in so many lives as believers that we're so focused on how we do things, why we do things, what we do. And if, Paul said it, that great line of God. And this is going to be part of my communion meditation next week as I get the pass on the first one. <laughs> I am determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and increases by uh, I believe if we would testify more of Christ, we could change the world a lot more quickly than we testify about the change in our own personal lives. Now we do overcome by the blood of the Lamb first and the word of our testimony. But if we don't have the blood of the Lamb, I know a lot of people that have changed their lives for the better without Christ. And if we just if we just tell people your life can be better, you can be happier, you can have greater peace, but we don't tell them that only through Christ, it avails us nothing. I mean, you could be as, as a moral of a person that is ever been. These Pharisees were moral guys. I mean, yeah, they. Now they took their morality above God. They, you know, look at me, look what I do. I have my phylacteries and my bells and my scriptures on my forehead. I have pre preeminence in the temple. Uh, but they, they miss it. These texts, uh, what we're looking at today, uh, and, yet, and yet last week, uh, wow, I mean, they, they're just, they're just, a while. So I do number one, right? No. You did one, two, four. You always get first. We switched up a little bit. And that's because they're already done. That's why you're yeah, yeah, uh, I'm going to get 100% on this. Jeff, thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Don't, just ignore my, my cookie while you're talking. Okay. <laughs> All right, so point number one says Can we believe the Bible amiss? And it's, it relates to uh, verse 39. You study the scriptures diligently because you think in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. And Pastor Tony so eloquently last week said that we need to make sure that when we study, we study things in context. That's so important. And, you know, understanding the, the literal meaning, the historical setting where it's at, the, the grammar of the time, and, the, and, and relating it to other parts of scriptures. And as we look through... Um, some related scriptures to that. Look at 1 Corinthians 11, 8 through 18 through 20. And it says, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. So that relates to how we have different denominations. Some people see it one way, some people see it another way. We've had a lot of arguments in the faith over things like that that have separated us and that, that, that divide us where there should be unity as believers. And Acts 15, 1 tells us that certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and they were teaching the believers, unless you're circumcised according to the customs taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. And so that was the way they were trying to push back on this freedom that Christ had offered to us. We believe in him. And it also says in Matthew 24, 44, that you can, so you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect it. We don't, none of us know when that hour could be. We see some of the world events and we think maybe it's coming soon and it quite, quite well can be. But no one other than the Father knows what time that is. Even Jesus said he didn't know what time that was. So, um, you know, when we look at this, it's kind of like you talk about context and to just to illustrate it, it's if you're looking at Google Maps, it would be like zooming in on one house. Mm. So specifically that would be what you're looking at. And, you know, as, as we mature and you know, a couple of us uh, have matured a little bit. Um, you know, we should be maturing in our study of the scriptures too. And I'm speaking about myself. Um, and and when we read the Old Testament, we should read it in light of the New Testament, how, how Jesus 
lives that out and fleshes it out. And, you know, the doctrinal differences we talk about in different denominations, you know, we, we have to remember, as Pastor Tony said, in, in, in your, is your security in Christ or your doctrine? Mm -hmm. And that's so important that we don't make it about our doctrine, but we make it about, about Jesus Christ, most importantly. You know, the Bible is the Word of God. It's literally God-breathed. And we're commanded to read it, study it, and understand it. And, and, and to have some great tools to use, which, you know, I've learned over time in my study. A good study Bible is great. Commentaries, a dictionary. Things that really help you flesh out what what the writers are saying that really has helped me grow in my walk. So that's point number one. Let's move on to point number two. And that says, what kind of life does Jesus offer? And it says in verse 40, you refuse to come to me to have life. And, you know, the life that Jesus offered us is, is an abundant life. It's, it doesn't depend on our circumstances, our health, or our living conditions, or, or even if we die. It's, it's a life that never ends. It's an eternal life. And we don't have to wait to the end of our physical life to enjoy that, which is great news. You know, it gives us peace. It gives us purpose. It gives us a destiny. It gives us the joy of facing any adversity, even the grave, without worrying about it. What's going to happen? We have that confident assurance. And we're also told that we're going to have trials in our lives. Um, Jesus says in 1633, I've told you these things so that in me you'll have peace. In this world you'll have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. So no matter what kind of trials and tribulations we're going to face throughout our life, I mean, certainly Jesus knew that. He was preparing to face the cross and the abandonment of his disciples. And, and we know the disciples weren't worried about having great things in this world because they all faced death, the death of a martyr other than John. And so it was more to it than that. And there is so much that we have to look forward to as believers. And uh, we have that love, that joy, and that peace that only comes from God. And God favors us with his grace. So that's point number two. Point number three says, then how do we glorify Christ? Verse 41 says, I do not accept glory from human beings. And we're told that we should be welcoming of people. Uh, Romans 15, 7 says, Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. So that's one way that we can bring glory to God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. It's not about rules or regulations. It's about living to glorify God. Um, and in, in Romans 5, 3, it says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. So we're going to have trials and tribulations in our life, but we have to overcome those trials and tribulations knowing that with God's help, um, we can do that. I, I, I was sharing with Pastor Tony this morning, I watched a movie last night that really, really struck me. I was talking about um, the Cokeville Miracle. I don't know if you've ever heard of that story. Um, I never knew that. We just, we just watched it on TV. Did you? Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Um, it's about a, um, an elementary school that's taken over by two crazed people, husband and wife, that want to, uh, they want to seek a ransom of $2 million per child in this school, which is a, a ridiculous amount. Um, they bring this bomb in there and it's on the gentleman's wrist and, and they threaten that they're going to blow this whole school up and kill everybody in the process. And by the grace of God, um, the bomb does go off and everyone in the school is saved. And, as you go, and, and, and throughout this process, these young kids start to pray. And, and, and what, a, what a fabulous story that is when you're faced with those type of adversities to see and I you know I remember Jesus saying if, unless you have the faith of the child you're not going to enter heaven and those those children understood it they got it and it's one of the things that that we've been talking about in our men's group about how we pass the baton of faith on to the next generation those kids had got it and they truly when faced with that life-threatening situation they're, they're praying and, and, and they were trying to they, they were crossing their arms when they prayed so they didn't you know show that, that they were praying and, and, and alienate this, this when, when terrorist. Was it was six, I think it Yeah, was it was May 16, 1986 in Cokesville, Wyoming. Was, 
be kind of interesting to see what those children are doing. Yeah. Well, the best part is at the end of the movie, yeah. it shows you oh. it shows you their actual pictures and their families yeah, and, yeah. and everything about what they were doing. It, it's just a fabulous uh, story of, of faith and, and how we can glorify God even in those trials and tribulations that we what face. What's the name of it again? The Cokeville Miracle. Cokeville, like C-O-K-E? Yeah, yeah like Cokeville. Yes. Yeah. It was a very praying community, like the this whole community still was built around Coke. that. Yeah. Hmm. The Coke. That's closed down. That's closed down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that closed down. yeah. <laughs> so I recommend that. It's, it's, it's just a great and fabulous. Yeah, um, and, and you see in there, and I don't want to give away stuff, but there's there's so many instances that happened that it could only have happened by God's grace. How how um, it's, it's miraculous. So I, I'm not going to ruin the movie. Watch it. I, I encourage you. All right. So point number four says, can we have the love of God amiss? And verse 42 says, I know that you that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. Now, Jesus, being the omniscient God. He, he not only knew these people, but he knew what was in their hearts. He knew that they didn't have the love of God in their hearts. And, 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 and men by nature can be enemies of God until this grace takes over, that love of God. Of, you know, they, these guys, they thought they were doing the right thing by, by trying to kill Jesus because he claimed he was God and he, and he broke the Sabbath laws. But in fact, they were killing the very Son of God. That's so hard to believe that it's right there in front of you and yet you missed it. And you know, we can do the same thing if we're not careful, but we want to make sure that we, we don't um, show the love of God in this. Bob, that is so interesting how those, those verses all go together because if you meet someone and, uh, or you know someone, there's a family member, and in their church they have a belief that's different from yours mm -hmm. and lovingly you know, they'll bring it up, because I'm not going to. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. if you just say kindly <coughs> why you believe differently, it could be something simple like a Christmas tree. Oh, it's there's no love there. I mean, I, like, I don't care. It's okay. Do what you want. I'll do what I want. But I'm not going to judge that, what you do. Certainly, I'm not going to judge that. Yeah. But so many times, that's where you end up with people just, mm -hmm. man, they want to mm -hmm. put that hand up and... Yeah. give you a stiff arm and it's like not you know mm -hmm. I didn't bring this up yeah. that certainly but that's where you need the love of God that, you know like Tony Amen. said last week if you only love those that love you big deal yeah. but yeah. loving those that I didn't say that right mm -hmm. <laughs> Bob said that, whoever said that. you know loving those that do have differences of opinion and uh, you know and, and you can feel they're judging you yeah. that you're not quite right it's okay on something so insignificant, something so even. silly, so yeah. silly. Yeah, yeah. It's Jesus not. is like 99.99 percent of the whole thing. Yeah, and yet that you would lose your love over something so ridiculous. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. I think that's. It, it's hard not to not to want to win those battles. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes, especially you know, even if you're with an unbeliever, you're, you're trying to. You're not gonna argue anybody to Christ. No. You know, mm -hmm. you got to love them to Christ. Exactly. And, and what we can miss the, we can miss the point so of that. I, I received a text this morning from someone that, that I think sort of touches on this. If we hate people more than we love the truth, we are likely worse than those we hate. Right. Truth makes people free, not hate. The problem is, it's easier to hate than to love truth. Mm. It only takes ignorant, ignorance to hate. It takes wisdom to know the truth. Your word is true. John 17, 17. Nice. Yeah, that was good. That's true. It was an accident. <laughs> what was good accident? It really was. Yeah. I, I send out, uh, it's called the 280 because each text is exactly 280 characters. Um, that's my fleece. If I can't say it in exactly 280, I won't say it. And uh, what I intended to send out was that you cannot separate the love of God from the body of Christ. Because we are his body, we're his bride. And and when I went to send it, it disappeared. Oh. On two computers. <laughs> and I thought, and I had a, a, not an argument, but Lord, is this you or is this the end? <laughs> Did you erase this? 
or did the enemy erase it? And, and it was this, just that still, small, whisper voice, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I did it or he did it, I'll work it for good. There you go. Amen. Praise the Lord. My turn? Passing off, yeah, passing book. Where am I? Fine. <laughs> <laughs> Let me back up just a little bit. As, as Bob was sharing these questions, you know, can we believe the Bible or miss? And the answer to that is yes. What do we do about it? And I think Sherry answered it very clearly. Focus on Jesus. God loves you. Um, I don't care what the argument is. Do you know that God loved you so much he sent his son to die for you? I, I am determined not to know anything except what? Jesus Christ, him crucified. And, and it just, it's the answer. It's just the answer. And, and uh, wow, what kind of life does Jesus offer? And I think a better question might have been, what kind of life are you showing that Jesus has given you? What's our testimony? And I'm not talking about you know, I was a sinner, now I'm saved, I was held on. No, no. <coughs> when people see you and me, what do they see? Is it the love of God or your love? If it's your love, it's pharisaical love. If it's God's love. And then, how do we glorify Christ? Um, I hope every one of us pray every day. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We glorify the name of God by honoring God and sharing. And then can we love God amiss? And I, I think, yeah. Uh, you know, Jesus even said, uh, the scriptures say, you love God because he first loved you. We can't even take credit for loving him. Uh, really? And then Jesus said, the only reason you love me is because I fed you. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, we were up at the safe house working, and a couple came from a, a church up in Pittsburgh to help out. And he does a lot with uh, missions in North Korea. And at 12 o'clock, his alarm went off. And he, um, he was telling us that uh, is what it is is that at noon, whenever some of the South Koreans were captured by the North Koreans at noon, they would always say the Lord's Prayer. And South Korea has adopted that, that now that's, they're called a prayer basically like it would be in the Muslim. And uh, so at noon his alarm went off, so said the Lord's Prayer. At noon, every day. Wow. They do it in the whole, I guess it's something that South Korea as a country does. Mm. Yeah. And you'll be surprised how many North Koreans do it as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, I think maybe loving God and miss might be answered there. If, if we hate more than we love the truth, we're probably loving God and miss. Missing the mark. Mm -hmm. Number five. Uh, are we still in review, right? We are. <laughs> we, it took us three weeks to get through our last semester, so we're all going to. The question is, why do we so often believe God, or believe man instead of God? I've come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me, but if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. Um, where, where was I? i got to get my thoughts here. Ah, matter of fact, I, I wrote, let me, let me read this to you. This might help, um, if I can find it. The subtle poison, selfish ambition is the mother of heresies. It always wants to be special. Ego, that old idiot, always wants to be the center of attention. We can't do enough to protect ourselves from this shameful wickedness. It disguises itself as honoring God. Martin Luther uh, wrote that, or said that. 
And one thing real quick about Luther, he was a colorful guy. His favorite word was not a pleasant word. He uh, spoke colorfully. Why would we believe man over God because of our selfish ambition? Uh, and it, it is vile. Uh, if our ambition is to be recognized, to have influence, uh, to be seen, to be heard, even for good, it's dangerous. And I, gotta, I battle that all the time. I, I really want to influence people for the gospel. And I, I have to be careful. Well, I can't influence anybody. Only God can do that. And so, you know, why do we do that? Why will we believe man over God? First of all, we're created in his image. We're pretty amazing. I, I told you I'll be teaching a class on the Renaissance in May at the Franciscan. And the whole purpose of the Renaissance was not to take away glory from God, but to send some of that glory to his creation, who we are creating his image. We're pretty amazing. I mean, really, I mean, mm -hmm. the things that God has granted us the ability to accomplish are unbelievable. Uh, and so, since we are God's creation, and we are fearfully and wonderfully made, people will look at us. Um, the world looks to the United States. Like, and if you don't think it's a, that's true, see how much of the world would like to come here. Anybody here want to move to North Korea, or even China, or the Ukraine, or Russia, Mexico? Uh, can't could. You know what else? Like if you, had a, if you had a second grader, and they're learning a certain kind of math, and they come home and they show you. But it's different from what you know. Mm -hmm. So you try to show them, no, my teacher said. Oh boy, this is the way. And so you don't know anything, you know. <laughs> and I think of um, when we were in San Diego, we were involved in a church, and um, some of them were King James only. And I mean, they would die for that. I mean, they would fight for that. And there were people that believed that, a lot of times their family. And I think that's how you can believe a miss, you know, or different denominations that don't even believe in Jesus. And you would think, how can someone stay in a denomination that doesn't believe in Jesus? Well, because their grandparents and their parents, and they yeah. want to, you know, they believe a miss. But I believe a lot of Christians believe a miss because they'll follow a pastor rather than God's word. And they're believing a miss. And they think they're they think they're doing the right thing. It's I think it's more common than we know. My father and I had a lot of discussions when I was growing up because he, he got involved with um, Gardner Ted Armstrong and that whole plain yes. truth movement and everything like that. And, and we had a lot of different discussions about that. And mm -hmm. My dad was one that really set me on the right path. But he really started taking that off ramp that that really yeah. you know See, separated I did, us. I did take that off ramp because I started following Armstrong. Yes, because I used to get all his material and everything else. Mm -hmm. Yes, all of it. Yeah. One of my uh, elders at Sunrise they have been called into brain. Uh, really, probably the highest IQ person I've ever known, and he was extremely intelligent. Mm -hmm. And we're no match when it comes to intelligent for the deceiver. Mm -hmm. If you rely on your own understanding, if we lean on that, we're going to start following man and we're going to be led down the wrong path. And, and it, it destroyed him. It literally destroyed him. Mm -hmm. you know, going on that wrong path. So uh, when Jesus would say, you know, you believe man instead of me, and again, we got to remember to whom he was speaking. He wasn't speaking to a bunch of ignorant, unspiritual, non-religious heathens. These were people that uh, were revered in, the, in God's kingdom. So, uh, here we go. Okay. And what brings us to point number six, where we're finally on today's list. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, we're on 
<laughs> which which is going to take us back two weeks, exactly. So uh, this is going to be a, a review, in case there's a blank there. Um, how can you believe, since you accept glory from one another, but do not seek the glory that comes from only God? That's from verse 44. Um, you know, the, the scribes and the Pharisees were, were just so ambitious of honor and respect from one another, as well as from the common people, that everything they did, they did it to be seen of men. Mm -hmm. And they wanted that applause mm -hmm. uh, from, from men. And, and they, they chose, and they got it by, you know, seeking out the most upper, uppermost rooms of the feast and the, and the chief uh, places in the synagogue. And, and they loved the pompous title of being called a rabbi. And, and, but they were in, in expectation of a temporal kingdom of the Messiah, one that was, was uh, an earthly kingdom. And they, they thought that they could advance and they could gain honor and, and profit from this. And it was a real hindrance to them believing in Christ. Um, the doctrine that they had, and, and they see you know, Christ's followers being poor and, and contemptible. And, and, and they, they made it a law also that anybody who uh, professed Jesus to be the Messiah would be cast out of the synagogue. So uh, they were... They, therefore, you know, many were convinced that he was the Messiah, but they were afraid to say so because of it. They, didn't want to get, they wanted that honor and respect from men instead of the praise that comes from God. And the honor that comes from him is, is being born of him. When we're a Christ follower, we're born of Jesus. We're a, we're a son or a daughter of Christ. We've got a new name, and, and it's pretty awesome to do that. And Jesus here points out how absurd it was for these teachers to make a name for themselves while rejecting the one that glorified the mm -hmm. Father. And, and when we look to Christ alone, we believe in Jesus, we, we're not seeking glory from men. Um, we're giving glory to God. And, and the question that I had is, I know Pastor Tony and I both love to read, but if, if we read the books of our favorite Christian leaders, what would happen if we only read those books and we never read the Bible? If you followed and worship those leaders instead of Jesus, would you really expect to go to heaven? I think not. Mm -hmm. So there's that real yeah. worry that we need to be careful of. Um, I appreciate the different books, but we have to go by the scripture and the word of God, not by some human leader who's... One way. One way. One way. That's right. Mm -hmm. The way the truth in the life. Okay, so much for our review. Just a thought when you were sharing back. I'm sorry we missed that Sunday. We, we were Presbyterians. <laughs> <laughs> Very stiff. And um, do you think, and this stuff, that's a legitimate question, mm -hmm. that the Pharisees became that high and pompous and finding the best seats uh, in the synagogue and be noticed. Do you think that came about because the people started exalting them? There was a time in my lifetime where pastors were always called reverend. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. What did that mean? They were revered. That's yes. what the word means. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, Reverend Seth, or Reverend Ben. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes. And, uh, I got a lot of stories about him. <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> but I, I, and I think we can do that. We can, we can. I think we need to respect leadership right. highly. We need to yeah. honor leadership, but be careful of. Maybe I'll use the word revering mm -hmm. leadership. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the things, and, and I, I'm an arrogant pastor. <laughs> I used to go to churches, and if there was a pastor parking spot, I'd want to let the air out of his tires. <laughs> <laughs> it really used to bug me. You know, why would you give the chief servant <laughs> the best uh -huh. parking spot? <laughs> So, you have to understand, we had a, we had a, well, the church was as big as the new high school, the new, the whole Toronto school, that was as big as Sunrise. 
the parking was all the way around it and then we bought a lot up on a hill behind us an empty lot it was a like a business uh, complex we bought that lot and he would park at the very back of that lot and walk down that hill across you know and that's what he taught staff to do because we are the greatest servant of all you know, well, we have had a uh, servant's entrance. Mm -hmm. So if you had a ministry, you parked in the dirt lot and came in the servant's entrance. Mm -hmm. It teaches you a lot, though. It well, you a lot. well, the one good thing I learned from, from my upbringing as a Presbyterian, we, you know, we studied the West, Westminster Shorter Catechism, and, and the first point was, was, what's the chief end of man? And it's to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. So that's one good thing I learned. Amen. It, is it true that when, if a Presbyterian falls down the steps, he says, I'm glad that's over with? <laughs> For yesterday. Okay, number seven. <laughs> we have a blank. We have, I missed that. We have work. <laughs> there, oh. well, there is a destination. That's right. When I was finished uh, preaching <laughs> at the Presbyterian, they all said, boy, that was so good. I'm glad it's over. <laughs> <laughs> Number seven, what is the purpose of the law? I will accuse you, I will not accuse you, this uh, misprint now, forgive me. I will not accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom you uh, have your hopes. Uh, the purpose of the law is to, to show us what sin is. Um, it was added in Galatians 3, 19 through 21. It was added because of transgressions until the seed, who is Christ, to whom the promise referred had come. Uh, when Adam and Eve fell, sin into the world, we had to know what it was. Really, when you think before the fall, uh, before they yielded to the temptation, there was no sin. I don't, I, I don't know this. I don't know if they could have done some of the things that we consider sin and it wouldn't have been recognized as sin. I don't think so. I think the key to their lives was truth. They never lied at all. They never gave a false compliment. You know, uh, when Eve ate maybe uh, too many pomegranates. Do you think I'm getting fat? And if Adam wouldn't have said, oh, yeah. oh no. <laughs> <laughs> After the fall, he said, oh, you look great, Chubby. <laughs> <laughs> so the purpose of the law, Paul, Paul summed it up. I would not have known sin if it wasn't for the law. I wouldn't have known you shouldn't covet unless the law had told you. Mm -hmm. And when you become as we're becoming and have become a lawless society, uh, literally all hell breaks loose. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, and there's no restraint. And so the law it isn't so much to tell us what not to do, but what to maybe avoid. And I think the greatest purpose of the law is to show us that we can't keep it aside from Christ in us. Um, so the purpose of the law isn't to condemn us, but to show us kind of, uh, Sherry said the other with the one way, there's a one way street, make sure you're going the right way on the one way oh, yeah. street. Mm -hmm. If there's a sign of, Hectagon sign, it's red, and it says stop. It means stop for your own good. Uh, you know, it's not just to be mean. However, the traffic signals in Toronto, Iowa, are from hell. I agree. They see you coming and turn red for no reason at all. And there's not another Only car within three. five miles. Yeah. And you've got to sit there like an idiot for 12 minutes. Yeah. I say that every Sunday. Come yeah. here. Um, I'm sorry. See, that's my sin nature. Just so I'll pass it over to Bob. All right. All right. Point number eight says, how was the Old Testament understood by the new? And verse 46 says, if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. 
So here Jesus is challenging the, the teachers of the law and some of the conclusions that they, they would reach if they took the message of the scripture at face value. And you know, they were searching the scriptures for their own criteria to merit their own salvation. All the while, you know, they failed to realize that the word was right there in front of them. Mm-hmm. And the one who promised righteousness through grace by, by believing in Jesus. You know, so, some scholars say uh, that there's more than 300 references to Jesus in the Old Testament. Pretty amazing. Um, and some of them would be some examples of uh, the, the sacrifice of Isaac, where Isaac, Abraham took Isaac to be that sacrifice, and Jesus provided the sacrificial lamb, or God provided the sacrificial lamb in Isaac's place, just as he provided Jesus. On Mount Moriah? On Mount Moriah. Yes. But Jerusalem? Yes. Um, so, and, and the same thing with the with the Passover lamb. You know, when, when the Israelites put the blood on their doorposts, that that um, uh, is just as we put our our uh, faith in Jesus and in His death and blood as He was shed for uh, the judgment that was due to us. Um, the bread of heaven, the manna that was provided the Israelites in the wilderness, and Jesus now is the bread of heaven. That, satisfies our spiritual hunger and gives us life. Um, when Moses smit the rock, um, that water that sprung from the rock, Jesus is now the living water. He satisfies our spiritual thirst. The bronze snake, when the bronze snake was lifted up in the desert, anybody that was bitten by the, by the deadly snakes could look at it and be saved. Now Jesus was, was lifted up so that anyone that was bitten by Satan our sin, we could look to Jesus and, and be saved from that spiritual death that we were, that we were doing. Maybe the clearest um, one is in, in Deuteronomy, where Moses said that God would raise up a prophet like me. And, and that's probably the clearest reference to the coming Messiah from Moses' writings. Also, we, we talked about Genesis 3, where you know God said he would, that Jesus would crush the head of Satan. And, and also, Jesus, similar to, to Joseph, uh, in the life of Joseph's work, you know, Joseph was that beloved son, and he was envied and rejected by his own. He was thrown in a pit. He was, he was, but he was resurrected. He was sent to a distant country where he became the Lord of all, and he provided, as Jesus did, for the salvation of his family, as Jesus provides the salvation to us. Um, yeah. Real quick on, on that. I can't emphasize enough in our personal scripture studies you will always, always, always interpret the Old Testament in the light of the New. Never, never the reverse. What happens if you try to understand the New Testament by the shadow of the Old? Of the old? You can be misled, you can be deceived, you can, you can eliminate Christ who's the light that shines on the whole world. Um, and if we try to understand the law and the prophets without the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, we can't. Uh, if we try, uh, we could probably do this and shine a light on everybody in heaven and let's see who we, if we can guess whose shadow that is. Uh, I mean, we might be pretty close, but we can be deceived pretty easily by the darkness of a shadow. Mm-hmm. But why would we want to look at a shadow when we can look at the person? Mm-hmm. And the, pers- the person is Christ. So, uh, uh, you know, do, Jesus said, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to what? To fulfill, fulfill them. them. Fulfill them. Yeah. Uh, number nine. Right? That's yes, you. That's you. Uh, can we believe in God? Uh, can we believe in the God of the new without the God of the old? Since you do not believe what he, Moses, wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? I, I hear this phrase a lot, not as much today as I did 50 years ago. We're a New Testament church. Uh, and there's some pretty big churches today preaching stay out of the Old Testament. Don't read it. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
man. Like God made a mistake. You know, I, 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 I'm in Numbers now, the book of Numbers, in my personal devotional reading. And, and if I look close enough, I'll see Christ, even in the book of Numbers. Uh, so can we believe in the God of the New Testament without believing in the God of the Old Testament? Well, our, the Jews try to believe in the God of the Old Testament without the New Testament. Uh, I, we can't separate God's work. Uh, we've got, it, it's the whole doctrine, it's the whole armor, it's the whole word. And so I, I, I really believe we uh, need to see God in his entirety. When you look at the sacrifices in the Old Testament, I mean, they were gruesome. I mean, just. Yeah. You know. and, and, and the wages of sin in the Old Testament. You, know, you were stoning your kids. You were burning the women at the stake. I mean, it wasn't that. But what did that show? The awfulness and the penalty of sin that Christ paid for. Uh, he redeemed us from that curse of the law. Uh, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them that it was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So we can't, how, how would we ignore the old if it's all about Jesus in the first place? Uh, now it is the shadow in, in the New Testament is the light uh, but we need uh, if there's no light there's no shadow I just made that up and they drank from the spiritual rock which Bob just said that rock was Christ and I, I think Bob if I in my this, this is for Tony if I would sum up this lesson the question I would ask what is my testimony? Uh, a better question, is my testimony Christ? Not where I was and where I've come, not what I do and what I don't do, but what Christ has done uh, in us. Is my testimony Christ? When, when I'm sharing Christ, it would be like, this is Bob Sullivan. He's, I don't believe Bob Sullivan. I don't believe there's a Bob Sullivan. Well, this is Bob, right here. I, I know it. He's my friend. And I know his wife. I, I, I know his <coughs> son. I, what do you mean, you know? That's silly. Now, you could argue about what he does for a living. Well, I have an idea what he does, but I'm not talking about what he does. I'm talking about Bob. He's my friend. And if we just focus on Jesus, how can you argue with that? I mean, you know, if, somebody, if you say, hey, I know Jesus, and they say, no, you don't. And you go, really? I do. You can know him too if you want to. Uh, and so, you know, Jesus said, basically, the law and the prophets point to me, the Torah points to me, your tradition points to me, all of creation points to me, uh, everything. And if we focus on that, Jesus Christ is my all in all. He's my testimony. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. Uh, and even sometimes when I, I, when I first got saved, uh, somebody says, well, Jesus is the Son of God. And I went, oh, okay. What, what does that mean? He's God's Son. All I knew was Jesus, and I didn't even know a whole lot about it. But I knew him. And then we grow in his grace and knowledge. Anyway.
And, and just a final point to touch base on, I think, you know, one of the things that can get in the way sometimes is our pride, especially the longer we've been a Christian. And you know, Proverbs 22, 4 says, by humility and fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. And when we learn to humble ourselves and glorify Jesus, you know, he can bless us in ways that just stagger our imagination. Maybe not in this life, but in the one to come. And so if we give glory where glory is due, it will go well for you.